Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We are excited to have our next author talk today with Rolf Diamant and Ethan Carr to talk about Olmsted and Yosemite. If you have found your way to this webinar without being familiar with the Preservation League, I'd like to do a brief introduction. My name is Katie Pease. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. We're a New York statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation and community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. And the League does that in all sorts of ways, including offering technical services, grants, our seven to save list of endangered historic sites, which we will be announcing next week, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, which we are currently accepting nominations for right now, our public policy and advocacy work that we do at the local, state, and federal levels, and a whole slew of online programs like this one. I wanna thank the Peggy Anna Roger G. Gary Charitable Trust who uh, supports our preservation book club event events, which this is part of. And today's author talk will be welcoming Ethan Carr and Wolf Diamant. Um, Ethan is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is an authority on America's public landscapes and he's the author of several books, including Wilderness by Design, Landscape Architecture and the National Park Service, and Mission 66, Modernism and the National Park Dilemma. And Rolf Diamant is a landscape architect and professor of historic preservation at the University of Vermont. He is formerly the superintendent of five national parks, including the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. And Rolf and Ethan collaborated to write the book, Olmsted and Yosemite, Civil War, Abolition and the National Park Idea, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, their book sets the historical record straight as it offers a new interpretation of how the American park, both urban and national, came to figure so prominently in our cultural identity and why telling this more complex and inclusive story is critically important. And the timing of this book is especially good considering that 2022 marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Law Olmsted. And we'll be part of that celebration along with our partners at Olmsted 200 for the rest of 2022. So make sure to check out their website to see all the great stuff that's happening across the country for Olmsted 200. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing or you just enjoy it so much that you want to share it, we encourage you to do that. You can find the recording on our YouTube channel within the next couple days. It'll also be on our website. If you have questions during the talk, we love that, and please drop them in the Q&A box. The chat will also be open for general comments, and I'll be monitoring that, but if you have questions for Ethan or Rolf, please drop them in the Q&A box. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ethan, who will get us started. Thank you, Katie. Here we are. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Rolf and I are going to be discussing this book, which is really about uh, the national park idea, or America's best ideas, it sometimes is referred to. And what we'll start with is really trying to reconsider what that idea is uh, and then where it came from. Um, and I think that's a uh, essential uh, sort of introduction to these ideas, because the first thing I'll say is that we really contextualize the national park idea and the broader American park movement that is municipal, regional, as well as national parks. And it's a movement that began in New York State, by the way, um, in New York City with Central Park in 1858. And we can, so we contextualize the history of natural national parks, uh, or at least the origins of national parks more directly in the turbulent years around the Civil War, leading up to the war, during the war, uh, and uh, in the period after the war. Um, and so America's best idea, so to speak, may be just that, uh, but it's really much broader than the national parks. It's the American park idea, uh, and in many ways, when I'm talking to students here at the University of Massachusetts, for example, I like to emphasize that it's the beginning of a lot of things, uh, what we today call landscape urbanism or sustainable urbanism and green infrastructure, uh, the, the more general effort to create a more sustainable and uh, just environment, uh, generally speaking. And if we think about the American park movement that way, uh, I don't think it's overstating it uh, that it could be at least a candidate for America's best idea. And so uh, we'd like to consider then national parks as part of that broader movement, uh, the, the, the whole movement to create parks in the United States. And we'd like to consider it in the context um, of the Civil War and the, year, and the turbulence around it, but also in the context of today, um, uh, because these are all issues uh, 
as I the ones that I was just mentioning that that uh, urbanists, landscape architects, um, and others are very involved in uh, today. And so we'd like to make that connection uh, between practice today and some of the ideas um, that we'll be talking about. Um, and the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that origin stories do matter. Um, uh, origin stories are important because they really help establish the identity um, and purposes of, of, in this case, the national parks. Um, it, they help really, uh, uh, they're a way of interpreting for the public uh, the meaning uh, and the values that they should associate with the national park system, for example. And, and even, you know, who goes to work for the National Park Service, who visits the national parks and what they mean to them and what they should feel, uh, what they should do uh, uh, when they visit national parks. And so we, we'll start by looking at what some of the origin stories have been um, so far. Uh, and it's really two campfire stories that we'll talk about, I'll talk about very briefly. Uh, one is uh, the uh, original story, um, which was uh, sort of promulgated in the early 20th century of uh, a, a campfire that took place on the Yellowstone Plateau in 1870. The Washburn Expedition consisted of scientists and explorers, uh, at least one operative of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, uh, and while sitting around a campfire exploring the Yellowstone region, they all um, came up with the idea that this should be a national park. And this was a very powerful origin story. Um, it was interpreted and, uh, by the National Park Service until really recently, 1980s, let's say. Um, uh, and it's a very powerful story because it gives this sort of idea of a virgin birth for the national park idea, a good triumphing over, triumphing over greed um, uh, and, and so on. And, and it's, it, it's a powerful story that way as origin stories tend to be. Uh, the only problem with it was by the 1960s, historians had really established that it was a fabrication and that it in fact was made up by N.P. Langford, who worked for Jay Cook at the Northern Pacific Railroad as part of a broader effort to, to popularize um, Yellowstone uh, uh, as a tourist destination. And so by the 1980s, this story got replaced by another campfire story, this one involving Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir camping out on Glacier Point at Yosemite in 1903. This one at least did take place. Um, uh, it was a campfire and they were there. Uh, what were they discussing? Well, in 1903, they weren't discussing the origins of national parks because the Yosemite grant had been made by Congress in 1864 when Roosevelt was a child and, and Muir was still working in a factory in Indiana. What they were talking about were other matters that had to do with the creation of the larger Yosemite National Park around Yosemite Valley and the eventual recession or giving back of Yosemite Valley to the federal government in order to make it part of that national park. Um, and so it was a, they were obviously giants of American conservation but it's uh, a little misleading to think that they were the, uh, the, the, the national park idea originated with them or indeed of the National Park Service, which was created in 1916. The legislation for the National Park Service established legally the purposes of national parks and neither of them had anything to do with that. Either Muir had died, uh, Roosevelt was out of office. But nevertheless, this is the story that is still interpreted today. So, uh, where, where would we go with this? Um, uh, the campfire stories are really important for, um, and they are important to this day uh, uh, for the identity of what the national park system is and, um, and possibly who should care about it, uh, which is really the important point here. Um, uh, on the left, we see John Muir's original, uh, uh, very influential book, a map of the national parks uh, uh, included in it. And on the right, we see Stephen Mather's park to park highway idea of 1915. And so what's happening here is the, the establishment of the identity of national parks as pristine Western reservations. And after, uh, as far as the first director of the park service, Stephen Mather was concerned, also a, a system in other words, connected by improved automotive highways. And so we, we see the establishment of the national parks as these wonderful, pristine Western reservations, mainly accessible by automobile. The federal government starts to subsidize highway improvements in 1918. Uh, obviously automobiles are more reliable and more affordable to the middle class. And so it's associated with essentially a mostly white automotive tourist middle-class 
uh, clientele, uh, the, the people who visit the national parks. And, and to some way, in some ways that, that is still true today, right? Um, and, and it's one of the great issues that the National Park Service faces is, is how, how to increase the appeal of the national park system to all Americans um, and, and how to get past this, this uh, identity, if you will, this set of values that appeals to a certain group of Americans while, while ideally a national park system uh, uh, has something for everyone and appeals to all Americans. And so this idea of origin stories mattering, they, they're, they're important. Um, and so that brought us to, to basically a, a revision of, of, of where the national park idea came from between contextualizing it with the rest of the American park movement in the Civil War years um, and with uh, addressing these origin stories um, and, and not replacing them with another myth. I think it's important to emphasize that. That's not our goal at all, but to contextualize where the idea came from in 1864 when Congress acted to create, uh, to to grant Yosemite Valley to the state of California for park purposes. So technically, yes, it was a state park, but it was created by Congress. So really it's the first national park and it's uh, and the Yellowstone legislation in 1872 to a significant degree is modeled on uh, the idea that was established at Yosemite in 1864. So what's happening in 1864, obviously the civil war is ongoing. Um, but also what else is happening? Central Park is still under construction and reaching, uh, it's, by 1864, it's become a popular phenomenon. And as the co-designer of the park, Frederick Olmsted is rather well known already. Um, and he also happens to be living in California, not far from Yosemite Valley, which was pure serendipity. Uh, nevertheless, um, that's where he was. And so when the state of California receives this grant in 1864, which Olmsted didn't have anything directly to do with, um, the, the, the commission that is established uh, to figure out what should be done with Yosemite Valley uh, was headed by Olmsted. The governor I mean, saw that he was there, knew he was the designer, co-designer of Central Park, um, and, and said, well, we have this great new park that we want to uh, develop, we want to manage, um, and we have this guy Olmsted right there, uh, we'll, we'll make him the head of the commission, and indeed Olmsted is the head of the commission and writes the Yosemite Report in 1865, which Rolf and I uh, reprint in the book, uh, and which uh, contains the ideas that in fact are the intellectual framework for developing a national park system in the United States, completely within this context of the, uh, 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 of, uh, the ongoing construction of um, Central Park, of the ongoing Civil War, and all the meanings and purposes that were associated with public parks at this time. Um, to get at some of those meanings and purposes, um, Rolf and I um, use this letter as an epigram uh, at, the, at the beginning of the book by Sarah Shaw, who someone almost had knew, corresponded with um, for various reasons. And we think this really captures the idea um, that Sarah Shaw would recognize that remaking government, making Central Park were somehow connected, that Central Park was uh, embodied and symbolized what the aspirations for the new republic would be after victory, of course, in the Civil War by the North, um, uh, and and that um, uh, and this kind of rhetoric, this ideology of what America, the American Republic, needed to become, how it needed to be remade, was linked to the ongoing construction of Central Park, uh, and therefore also of Yosemite. And the first thing um, we can observe is that whatever Central Park meant for the city of New York and the future of cities uh, in the United States, to a significant degree, Yosemite took on uh, uh, similar meanings for the nation as a whole, for the remade um, Republic. Uh, Sarah Shaw, of course, was also the, father, the mother of um, uh, Robert Goulshaw, who um, famously died um, uh, a few years later um, with um, about uh, 100 black troops uh, in South Carolina. So this was a period of intense commitment, of intense uh, ideas about the remade Republic. And we see Sarah Shaw linking these ideas um, to the uh, creation of Central Park. Um, even more importantly, I would suggest these two places as different as they are, and I understand their differences, 
um, uh, uh, also shared certain purposes and certain meanings. Um, first of all, the general purpose in both cases, as Olmsted is defining it in the 1865 Yosemite report, has to do with the necessity of for the general public to have accesses of great scenic beauty, of landscape beauty. Um, and that was really how the importance of Central Park was being framed. And it's how he also frames the importance of Yosemite Valley as a public park. That places, experiences like these were necessary to individual well being and therefore to the successful uh, sort of functioning of society as a whole. Um, th these are these are a public health measure, in other words, uh, broadly speaking, in terms of emotional as well as physical health, and that if parks were not created, uh, people in general would not have access to these places because they would be monopolized by the few, by the wealthy, by the very rich, who could afford to go to the Catskills for the summer or could afford to stay at a resort hotel in Yosemite, etc. But as public parks, they would be available um, to everyone and that that was therefore a necessary duty of government to create parks. Um, now, of course, Rolf will talk more about this and we both acknowledge everyone in 1864 um, did not mean everyone. It probably still doesn't. Um, um, the people who were displaced to create Central Park and Yosemite Valley uh, were not part of this uh, vision of, of the public and how the public would benefit from the creation of these places. But it's worth noting that they are park making is being put forward as necessary public health infrastructure. That's the justification for government to be involved in making them. They're necessary to a healthy society and for individual health. Uh, very important piece of political justification and rhetoric that I'm not sure <laughs> we still uh, understand or believe. Uh, or maybe if we believe it, I'm not sure governments are still acting on that belief. Um, secondly, these places also shared meanings. Uh, I've already alluded to those, but the aspirations of this remade republic. Um, think about the 1850s and 60s and all that's going on, the abolition of slavery with um, the, the, the remaking of the Republic following the war after the violence of the war. What were those aspirations? Well, of course, a Republic without enslaved people, uh, one that preserved the Union and allowed it to assume a better form, which if still imperfect, would at least be reaching toward the still unattained goals that it had been founded on. Uh, and this kind of Republican ideology, Republican being the party of Lincoln, of course, the newly established Republican party, was the, 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 the rhetoric of the union of, of uh, during this incredibly uh, violent period in American history. And, and, and these places assumed tremendous symbolic significance and meaning that were shared broadly, maybe not by uh, uh, Southern slaveholders, but, um, uh, but by those who uh, were um, looking to remake the Republic in a better form following Union victory. Uh, another way to look at this is the public park, both at Yosemite and at Central Park is emerging as a public institution in the United States. And when we think of all the great institutions that are formed through the war and the years following the war, uh, many different cultural institutions, literary and, and, and newspapers and magazines, uh, uh, government uh, institutions. Uh, if we see the public park as one of the institutions that becomes foundational to the remade republic, it also helps explain why these places are so important uh, to this day uh, in, in many senses of national identity, shared purpose, uh, um, uh, they are part of the institutional foundation that comes out of the Civil War years. Um, uh, and, um, and as we know, the Civil War produced a lot of institutions and a remaking of the Republic. Um, and and to, to a significant degree, that's still important, as, uh, at least uh, uh, to some degree. Um, another way of looking at this, um, Central Park. Um, now, of course, there were precedents of parks in Europe, and every, we all know about those, and everyone knew about them uh, then as well. Uh, but a republic, which is what the United States was, even though it was fighting for its life, um, would need to make its own parks if it were to be like European cities, where parks were generally the vestiges of aristocratic forms of government. 
And remember, the 1848 failed Republican revolutions of Europe were still fresh in people's minds when monarchists, more autocratic forms of government had suppressed republicanism, in part because people equated republicanism with mob rule. And so the idea that a republic would make great public parks, like the Royal Parks of London, for example, uh, was controversial because the mob uh, in a republican society uh, would take it over. We had chaotic government and the, the results of government engaging in this kind of public project, they said, would be um, chaotic as well. And so the creation of Central Park uh, is really a, a, a radical act at this time because it embodies a Northern vision for how cities could not only survive and be tenable, uh, but would actually be beautiful. Uh, and it refuted directly an image like this, uh, the, the, the Southern propaganda that your cities had worse conditions than our plantations, for example, which an outrageous thing to say, uh, but an image like this was a direct rebuttal. Um, and as we see here uh, in Atlantic Monthly quote, um, uh, the park was actually a, an affirmation of, of the idea of self-government itself, or as Calvert Vox put it, it was the big artwork of the Republic. Um, and I'd like to also uh, address this idea that, um, well, experiences of landscape beauty, they may have thought that was important in the 19th century, but what, what does that mean today? Well, um, I think it means still means a great deal. And I think it, these kinds of experiences, this is Fawn's Leap in, Cat, in the Catskills, by the way, for those of you who, uh, uh, you can still go there. It doesn't look exactly like this, but uh, uh, it's, it's a real place. And we see here uh, William Cullen Bryant with Thomas Cole, Bryant, of course, being one of the great proponents of, of Central Park. Um, but this idea of experiencing natural beauty, of experiencing landscape beauty as being essential to human health and therefore a political duty of government to make, it a, to make, uh, to make parks that would be, uh, make these experiences available to all people. I mean, that, that, that direct sort of reasoning, rhetoric, political justification depends on whether you think that the experience of landscape beauty actually is that important. And it's easy to dismiss it. Oh, that's elitist, it's dated, it's ethnocentric, et cetera. But I would make the connection to the last 30 years of social science that suggests that if you don't express it in aesthetic terms as they did in the 19th century, and we talk about experiencing nature or the natural world, or we talk about biophilia, or we talk about nature deficit disorder, or any of the new terms that have come up that seem to suggest actually there's an important idea here that people do need access to natural, the natural world, let's say, uh, uh, natural beauty, if, if I may put it that way, uh, in order to lead healthy and fulfilled lives. And therefore it should be, uh, uh, it is infrastructure. It is something that government should be involved in. Um, and so I would suggest that we can make that connection. And so if we consider all of this, when the state commission and the governor of California received the Yosemite grant from Congress in 1864, it's really not too surprising that, that they chose Olmsted to chair the commission um, and to write the, the Yosemite report, which is really the subject of our book. Um, um, because it made all kinds of sense. Um, uh, the purpose and justifications of this new park were similar to what Olmsted had already been describing for Central Park. And yes, they're in very different places. And um, one would argue, but in Yosemite, you can experience um, much more wilderness. Um, and that's true. Uh, but in Central, if you, you can also experience landscape beauty and the natural world in Central Park. Um, and, and there is a common purpose and a common set of meanings uh, 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 relating to contemporary events around the Civil War in both of these places. Um, you could also say, well, Central Park is a designed landscape and Yosemite is not a designed landscape. Well, it's not entirely true. Uh, Central Park has, is based on the, the existing site, the existing landscape that was there. 
uh, and it was in, it, through a lot of money and a lot of design, it was improved into a series of landscape scenes that wouldn't have existed otherwise. But no one created the uh, mica, rock, uh, mica schist outcrops uh, or the topography or the existing vegetation on the site. So it's, it's, it's less design than we sometimes um, uh, assume. And at Yosemite Valley, of course, it was a cultural landscape that was already thousands of years old that had been managed by indigenous people. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, it did get designed to some degree because Olmsted suggested the carriage road, uh, the pedestrian paths, the overlooks that were typical of park development uh, at the time. Now those suggestions were not followed. They did exactly what he told them not to do uh, and put in lots of hotels and other things. Uh, and, but the Yosemite report, I hasten to add, was not lost. It simply was ignored by the state of California uh, and Olmsted took it back with him uh, to New York in 1865 and uh, he had it, access to it. Frederick Olmsted Jr. had access to it and what more importantly the ideas it contained in it certainly did not die um, or, or uh, get lost and, and uh, Rolf will talk more about that. Uh, and these are just some ideas extracted from the Yos Yosemite report um, uh, um, that this is why I describe the report as the intellectual framework for a national park system, but it's more than that. It's, it's an intellectual framework and justification for the American park movement in 1865. And we wouldn't necessarily express uh, all of these ideas uh, in exactly the same way, but nevertheless, I think these are extremely important ideas today. Um, <clears throat> and, and they still guide to a significant degree, both urban and national park management. Um, uh, although, as I sort of suggested, I'm not sure that everyone uh, in government really understands or uh, still really thinks about all of these ideas. Uh, but this is a useful summary, if you like, of at least some of them, this idea of gov government having a duty, uh, uh, the idea of landscape and nature being necessary to health the idea that um, uh, they are also necessary to help, a or don't, not necessary, but help a diverse democracy function. Because of course, congregation as well as individual experience uh, and the building of a sense of community are another uh, aspect of public parks that Olmsted wrote about extensively. Um, all of these ideas um, seem to me to still be very relevant today. Uh, we can talk more about that as we move into uh, the discussion phase. Um, and Olmsted knew it. Um, you know, in this famous letter in 1893 to um, uh, J.C. Olmsted and Charles Eliot, he's saying, look, we've begun this and it's, it, this idea is going to sweep across the continent. And he didn't live to see that, neither did Charles Eliot. Um, uh, but in fact, this is what I'm talking about. You know, this idea that the American park idea is not simply going to be something we associate with the urban parks that Olmsted designed, but the idea takes on a new dimensions, new scale, new purposes in life as it becomes a regional park movement. And this is what he's really referring to uh, in this letter to Charles Elliott, uh, but also a state park uh, movement, also a national park movement. As, as parks are created, it's not, there's a reason we call them parks, uh, because they share this rhetoric, this justifications that he's laying out in 1865 um, that apply to urban parks as, as well as national parks. And so it is a good idea. And it had tremendous results in North America um, uh, as various park commissions at various levels of government uh, uh, laid out all kinds of parks, historic parks, et cetera, um, all over uh, the United States. Um, and so I will be quiet now and Rolf will take over and then we will have discussion. Thanks, Ethan. Um, I, I'll provide a little bit of context. To, uh, the, let me go back here. This is moving in the wrong direction. 
Here we go. Okay. Uh, really quickly, uh, just so we have some time for questions. Um, of course, I'm not advancing these. Hmm. Um, Olmstead is known as uh, the designer of Central Park and Ethan's talked about uh, sort of the popular vision. Uh, of course, we're talking about someone who is better known for his, uh, as a chronicler of um, the South, pre-war South, slavery and Southern society. Um, and someone who of course saw slavery as uh, the greatest impediment to the nation's progress. Uh, this was, of course, a time when Southern politicians uh, focused on safeguarding the institutional, institution of slavery, and they had no interest in large civic improvement and national investments. Uh, they successfully blocked land grants for education, for transportation, for homesteading, and they were content with a relatively weak central government, you know, basically... Uh, that had the responsibility for delivering the mail, safeguarding settlers on the frontier, and pursuing fugitive slaves. Um, they preferred to fund and finance this anemic government, if you will, through the sale of public lands in lieu of personal taxation, thus avoiding taxes on the enormous personal wealth accumulated through enslaved labor in the United States. Uh, Olmsted uh, was perhaps uh, uh, better known as a writer in those days and is probably his most well-read book, uh, Cotton Kingdom, uh, became a classic, a first-hand account of um, pre-war enslavement in the United States. Uh, even in the 20th century, it was described by Malcolm X as eye-opening. Um, and the book's title is, in fact, in a very ironic reference to the words of South Carolina Senator James Hammond, who had infamously declared on the floor of the U.S. Senate that cotton was king and that the economic power of cotton would, in fact, quote, bring the whole world to our feet. And people were listening. And so it should come as no surprise in 1861 that the Southern planter elite finally chose to abandon the democratic experiment of the American Republic. They walked and they confidently launched a rebellion on behalf of their wealth and slavery and uh, chose not to accept the free and fair election of Republican Abraham Lincoln as in fact, the next president of the United States. Uh, thus the war headed into uh, its uh, most difficult period, the, Certainly by the second year of the war, it had become, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, uh, a um, revolutionary and remorseless struggle. Uh, but it was uh, during this period um, in 1862 that there were vast numbers of uh, enslaved people who chose to self-emancipate uh, by seeking sanctuary behind uh, federal lines. This number grew to hundreds of thousands, uh, and it would accelerate the hollowing out of the Confederacy and its ultimate collapse. And uh, this new alliance with federal armies uh, would place enormous pressure on the Lincoln administration to release its agenda, including the acceleration of its plans for emancipation. Uh, and, and once it became clear that there would be no uh, settlement to the war, a uh, negotiated settlement, that would return the country to a pre-war status quo, things in fact began to happen very rapidly in Washington. And during just a five month period in 1862, there was a raft of legislation and an extraordinary expansion of the scope and duties of the national government. Um, and Congress and the Lincoln administration built in effect a more activist republic focused on improvements that served a broader, uh, larger, constituency of people. Uh, the capstone, of course, was um, uh, of this, what's been called this the Second American Revolution. 
um, was the authorization for recruiting black soldiers into the United States Army, followed by Lincoln's release of his preliminary emancipation proclamation. Now, on the heels of this uh, comes uh, the 1864 Yosemite Act. Um, this was just another federal land grant um, to uh, uh, another piece of pre-war legislation um, that would um, create this great park in Yosemite Valley as another benefit of um, this new birth of freedom, Lincoln's new birth of freedom. Now, for years, many historians have been puzzled by uh, the, uh, the 1864 Yosemite Act. They've been at a loss to explain it. I mean, either they described it as an anomaly or, a, you know, perhaps a mistake. Um, it was a great mystery. They couldn't understand, couldn't comprehend why Congress would take time out in the midst of the war to consider this legislation. Uh, we, Ethan and I think quite to the contrary, it's just, it was just another step of national improvement squarely in, uh, in the framework of this larger uh, agenda of uh, wartime reform and uh, constitutional change. In fact, as Lincoln believed, if an insurrection could interfere with the functioning and continuity of constitutional government, quote, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us all. Now, the, the, this 1865 report that Olmsted wrote that uh, uh, Ethan referred to uh, provided a, a singular opportunity for Olmsted to share an, an effect an aspirational vision for what the country was going to be when the war ended. Um, you know, this was written in the closing months of the war, and Olmsted was thinking of a, of a reconstructed nation where great public parks could in fact be a keystone institution of a renewed democracy. Uh, and and he, he almost did refer to every person's entitlement in this vision of his to enjoy the nation's most spectacular landscapes. And in the process, as Ethan mentioned, he was framing what was the foundation, the intellectual foundation for a system of national parks. And he declared the establishment of government of these great public grounds for the free enjoyment of the people is thus justified as a political duty of government. And he believed the government had uh, an obligation to support these great public grounds on an equal footing with all its other major duties. Now, as Ethan said, this goal was, didn't apply to everyone in, in, at that point in time, uh, and it's still not fully realized for all people. And, and indigenous people were never included among the beneficiaries of Lincoln's new birth of freedom as they were forced out of their ancestral lands. In fact, by the, the, the same Republican land policies uh, we're talking about. Early writers who described Yosemite Valley as untrammeled wild nature willfully overlook countless generations of human occupation. Now, um, you know, given uh, the, this history of the Yosemite grant, uh, you know, we can ask the question, you know, why do we consider, you know, where, where did Yellowstone come from? Always considered the first national park. And how does it figure then into the origin story for national parks? Well, part of the answer that Yosemite, in fact, was an essential catalyst, a template, if you will, for Yellowstone. And then part of the answer lies, uh, we believe, in um, this period of changing expectations of what the government could do. And of course, this was a period of uh, congressional enforcement of reconstruction for a period of time, and also the passage of the 14th and 15th amendments to the US Constitution. So a period of, uh, of a great expansion of people's expectations for what government could do for them. And finally, you know, the national parks, the idea of national parks were never preordained. In our book, uh, in fact, uh, we, we make the case that if the Yosemite grant had been introduced 
say just a handful of year, years earlier, say in a pre-war Congress where uh, there was still held back by slavery and by this small government ideology, it supported a park like Yosemite would never have been uh, enacted. It would have been blocked like so many other uh, initiatives. And without a union victory, uh, and this is the grand celebration in May of 1865, uh, that was aided by the mobilization of nearly 200,000 black soldiers. Legislation for Yosemite and um, uh, Yellowstone and many of the early national parks that followed might in fact never have been enacted. Now, um, early national park um, advocates and the early publicists um, were content with origin stories that had nothing to do and were totally unburdened by the Civil War, by emancipation, by Olmstead, by the 1865 Yosemite Act. Uh, they, they didn't have any connection to those stories they wanted an image of pristine, uninhabited Western landscapes reimagined as national parks by either great uh, heroic explorers or famous conservationists, such as on this commemorative coin, 2016 commemorative coin of John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. And, and these would serve as uh, much more comforting and affirming narratives. And any reference to Olmsted, of course, uh, had, had to be omitted from this official history uh, when it was written in the early years of the 20th century, because he was probably too closely associated with Central Park when the new national parks were being marketed as a concept born in the rugged West, not in an urbanized East. His book, Olmsted's books, which strongly condemned slavery in the, uh, the Old South, um, were uncomfortable at a time when the Civil War was being reinterpreted through the lens of the lost cause. Um, and, you know, reconciliation between North and South was a national obsession. At the same time, Jim Crow and segregation were ascendant across the country. Um, the film Birth of a Nation was screened in the White House in 1915. That's just the year before the legislation passed for a National Park Service. So it shouldn't perhaps come as a surprise to us that advocates for a new National Park Service bill chose to omit these Civil War connections in this contextual framework when wooing Southern congressmen and Southern born president were their top priorities. Um, and the National Park Service acclimated to a, a prevailing climate of racial inequity. This is a image of a sign from uh, Shenandoah National Park that was developed with segregated park facilities in the early 1920s and 30s. Even the dedication for the Lincoln Memorial in 1922 had segregated, ironically segregated seating for attendees. So to conclude, um, you know, why do we need to talk about this now? Our book makes the case that it's timely to tell a refreshed and more inclusive history of our national parks. And, and it's necessary to re revisit our past with an openness to new information, uh, an ever wider context uh, that sheds new light, not only on the past, but on our current decisions we make today. And we think that the 1865 re Yosemite report, in fact, is still useful to us. If we can turn to it now and look at it as a timeless appeal for equitable access to all parks and a powerful affirmation of government's responsibility for the creation and stewardship of parks now and, and, and hopefully forever. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ethan and Rolf. Um, I'm Katie Como. I am the Vice President for Policy and Preservation at the Preservation League of New York State. Um, and I am 
coming to you today from the Olmsted city of Rochester, New York, uh, where we're very proud of our, our Olmsted parks. And um, so I, I, you know, I read your book kind of from the perspective of a, another Olmsted city, which is, which was of course later than uh, Yosemite, but uh, I try to make those connections in my mind where I can. Um, and I'm going to, I have a few questions that I have thought about in advance, but we also have one question so far from one of our participants here, which has to do with um, the role of Carlton Watkins early photos of Yosemite and the showing of his photos in New York City in 1862 as part of the origin story of the national parks. So I wondered if you can talk about that and about kind of art more generally and how that also is part of the origin story of the parks, because I know you do talk about that in the book. Do you want me to speak to this, Ethan? Yeah, please, Rob. Um, <clears throat> it was hugely influential. Uh, Watkins' uh, portfolio was sh uh, widely shared in the East at considerable expense. Uh, and it was a time when people were, you know, so um, Umstead uses his Yosemite report to really tell the history of this. But as Umstead says, it was a time when there was a heightened sensibility and susceptibility to art and photography. And so Watkins photographs were hugely influential. They were shown in the US Capitol building. They were shown in a gallery in New York City. Uh, Bierstadt went to the gallery, saw the photographs and traveled, got them passed by the, from the War Department to travel west to, you know, paint the Yosemite Valley. And he did so many, many times. And he, it was hugely successful in popularizing um, um, Yosemite. Also, these great sanitary fairs that were held in the major cities of the North were places also to spread this message. The most expensive painting sold uh, at the New York City, it was a week long sort of almost a mini World's Fair sanitary commission event was a Bierstadt painting of Yosemite. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they helped uh, with the passage of the Yosemite legislation, no question, essential. And then a follow-up question about that has to do with stereo views in particular and spreading photographic images at the parks. Um, can you talk about the, the importance of those particular format of photography? I, I can answer that one, Rolf. Please. I mean, Rolf's, allu Rolf's alluding to the, the general proliferation of imagery, right? As, as far as visual culture goes in the United States at this time. And, and the photographic expeditions to the West were a huge part of that. Uh, Watkins was only one. There were, there were many others, many of them being sponsored by railroad companies who were interested, you know, uh, as they always were in increasing traffic on their lines and getting settlers interested in settling and buying the land that they had been gr granted as a subsidy to build their lines. Um, and, and stereographs are part of that. Um, and, and you see them for Central Park. They were very influential in, in uh, spreading the imagery of, of Central Park. It was, um, and even the Bachman engraving that I showed, that big colored engraving, that was like the latest technology, you know, as far as imagery goes, these big colored lithographs, um, uh, photographs. Um, uh, Olmsted and Vox at Central Park used photographs, which were probably taken by Matthew Brady, the great Civil War photographer. And of course, this goes to the imagery of the war that for the first time was being recorded in photographs. And blew people's minds. Um, uh, but but the um, Carlton, uh, uh, Matthew Brady uh, was taking before photographs of the Central Park site and Calvert Vox was providing little sketches and watercolors of the proposed effect, what we call a Reptonian presentation in the business. Uh, but but in fact, that was, you know, the cutting edge presentation technology. It's the, it's the equivalent of using like Lumion today and, and having photo real uh, 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 representations of a proposed design, you know, with people walking through it and, you, you know, all that, all that stuff. They do like cinematic effects now. Um, but, but um, uh, and, and so the, the stereographs were, were part of that um, and people really enjoyed seeing them 3D imagery um uh, uh through their viewers uh and so forth but there was a lot more to it 
Um, uh, and I think the connection with Matthew Brady is, you know, one we didn't talk about in, in the book, Rolf, but the fact that Matthew Brady was doing the before photographs for those boards that won the Central Park competition in 1858 and then went to the Civil War and became famous for his gory battlefield scenes uh, is interesting. Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't mention this in the book, but uh, yeah. I think that the, the Gopal Gallery was the gallery where uh, the Watkins mammoth images were, were displayed. I think uh, they had just previously had an exhibit by Timothy O'Sullivan uh, of the, um, his photographs of the Battle of uh, Antietam or the after effects of the Battle of Antietam, the, all these bodies lying in the field of battle that was just hugely sobering and, and, and deeply troubling. And I think there is something to do with the contrast to go from one to the other, that they, they represented a future, a different future for the country that would emerge from this terrible sacrifice that was occurring in places like Antietam. Mm -hmm. Something I was thinking about is how the idea of both urban parks and national parks is just so normal to us now and so ingrained in our kind of consciousness and identity, identity that it's hard to think back to that being a new or controversial idea. So I was wondering about what public reactions were at the time to the idea of setting all this land aside for public use, if that was controversial, if that, if people's reactions were kind of related to their political or regional affiliations, you know, how that, how that idea was received at the time. Depends which history you read, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, there were there was controversy, um, and, and and you know you read contemporary newspaper accounts of Central Park, and people were predicting it would be a disaster because it would be taken over by um, a bunch of roughnecks. Um, uh, Irish and German was the main fear, I think. Um, uh, but uh, and 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 of course uh, Yosemite. I, I don't think that Yosemite, Rolf. You can talk about this. There was tremendous controversy over the homesteading claims uh, that got turned down by the, by the Supreme Court. Um, if you read The Park and the People by Bl Rosenzweig and Blackmar, who have a very sort of socialist and anti-Olmstead interpretation of Central Park history, um, uh, you'll see that there was tremendous controversy and the, the, that um, a lot of the Irish and German immigrants downtown wanted the battery improved and extended so that they could have something near the Lower East Side. And it was all the toffs, you know, the the upper uh, the uh, upper class Protestants who, who wanted a project like Central Park. Um, I think that all is, to some degree, it's true. There was controversy to some degree, it's sort of manufactured by later historians because the the thing that happened in both cases at Central Park and Yosemite is that capitalist interests recognized it would be in their favor to support these projects. And it's the 19th century. And if you have real estate and developer interests in New York backing the park idea, that's the end of the discussion. Um, and, and, uh, and in the case of Yosemite, you've got um, railroads or Yosemite and other national parks. You've got railroads backing the idea of national parks because they want to promote in general the West, but also increase traffic on their lines. And as I said before, also, increase the, the, the value of the land that they were being given by the federal government to subsidize the creation of their rail lines. Um, and, and so when you have forces like that at work and they're recognizing that this park idea might work out for them very nicely, you see the convergence of good and greed. It's not good versus greed with, with parks. Um, it's, it's good and greed. Um, and the, and flips, so, the flip yeah. side of this too is that the, you know, there's always been opposition. Uh, it was opposition to Central Park as, you know, it was too expensive. Um, and there was, you know, skepticism uh, that um, the, the, it could be pulled off. Um, and, you know, the, the history of national parks is not a, uh, a linear progression. I mean, they, they were, as Ethan alluded to, even Yosemite, once it gets enacted, two years later, they're wrestling whether to uh, permit uh, homestead exemptions in Yosemite Valley, private holdings uh, for hotels and other, other development. Uh, it's a battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, 
so in the early history of national parks are small victories that are challenged and it's a it's a constant battle to this day i mean you know if you look at bears ears i mean that seemed to be a you know a done deal until it was reversed and now it's you know it's back but um it to, to, to think that there there is we go from one triumph to another is not an accurate reading of history there is constant um uh, rear guard actions to consolidate and hold on to the gains that have been made mm -hmm. I think, um, well, we were talking about this a little before we got uh, the webinar going, and then I think Ethan alluded to it to, in his talk as well, in terms of kind of the relevance of these ideas today. You know, we're definitely in a time when democracy and privatization of resources and, you know, a, a lot of these ideas are, are very much at the, the forefront role and size of government. So I wondered if you had thought about Kind of the relevance of of Olmsted's ideas in the Yosemite report and how they how those resonate today with kind of our coming back to a lot of the same issues again. Well, if you want to go first, you want me to go. Yeah, I would just say it's it's the conclusion of the book and the conclusion of our presentation, which is that these issues are still with us. The the, the appropriate role of government, uh, government's responsibility for. Uh, uh, essential infrastructure, as Ethan's just described it, and parks are essential infrastructure for our societies. Uh, these are responsibilities which, um, you know, there's this constant give and take on federalism and the, what, what the appropriate role of government is. You know, do we, do we shrink it so we can wash it down a drain or do we use it to advance the progress of society? It's a constant battle. And I think what the, the, the Olmsted's report reminds us, you know, he, he was able to um, visualize uh, what he called a, um, uh, a benevolent and equitable society. And we're still struggling for that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll just add, I'm not, um, I know pri privatization and partnerships have, have made urban park renaissance possible. Um, that's the, the reality of my professional life. Um, uh, we may or may not be at a turning point though, because um, while partnerships can do certain things, they can't do other things. And government has to do those other things. For example, if we're really going to talk about equitable park systems, if we're really going to be talking about um, adequate funding, for park systems um, in all cases, not just, you know, Central Park. Um, uh, uh, you, you governments have to be more involved and have to fund parks um, as essential infrastructure. So I think that's part of our message is that, yeah, what are these ideas again? Maybe they, maybe they actually are important. Uh, another is the National Park Service has a stated goal of increasing diversity of both people who work there and people who visit national parks. And yet they cling to these campfire tales without recognizing what that might have to do with anything. And it's the whole image and identity of the national park system. And I don't want to suggest that the National Park Service has to go out and change its essential identity and, and make people very upset. Uh, but, 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 but by recognizing a different origin story for where the national park idea comes from, it does. And Rolf, you, you have talked about this. A lot. It lets more people but, in. Yeah, it, 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 it suggests that actually all Americans have a stake here yeah, and that, that these places uh, and, and these places wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for black Americans involvement in self emancipation and their role as soldiers in the Civil War, because if the Civil War hadn't been won by the North, we wouldn't have a national park system. Um, and, 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 you know, so ideas like that help broaden the um, The sense of who the national parks belong to. Uh, not just a white middle class automotive public, um, but but in fact they belong to the republic in all of its imperfections, uh, with, with you know Indian removals, with uh, the terrible uh, history of racial um, strife, all of its imperfections. The, this system belongs to everybody, and 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 we need to have an origin story that's m more readily accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yep, very, 
very, uh, <laughs> very good point. Good way to end it. I think it looks like Katie's back coming back to us here. Yeah, we're just about out of time, but um, did you have any final questions or any final thoughts before we wrap it up here? I think Ethan gave a very good summary. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll you just usually say, say that part, Rolf. I know, Ethan. <laughs> you're 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 getting you're getting good. I have to I have to I have to fill in for you there. <laughs> you both are very well practiced, I think. Um, and I'll say to our audience, you know, thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't had a chance to get the book and read the book, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, and. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you, Katie, for this conversation. We really appreciate your time, your expertise. And, you know, thank you for writing the book and being part of this event with us. Oh, thank you. I'm just thank looking you through your attendees list. Um, <laughs> I was trying to find someone, but I, oh, that's all right. Um, <laughs> well, anyone, anyone who wants to get in touch it? with me can find me. Yes, I, and we'll have this on our website, on our YouTube, so you can always reach out to us at the League if you want more information, but we appreciate you all tuning in and reading along with us, as always, in our Preservation Book Club, and we hope to see you at another event soon. And thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>